Uh, our esteemed lunch speaker is in many ways precisely uh, the model of what a Texas Next Generation uh, fellow should be. Energetic, innovative, accomplished, and at least appearance-wise, far younger than his quite full biography would lead you to believe. A last note. <laughs> <laughs> Evan Smith, you all know him. Uh, he's got an extraordinary biography. Uh, I'll only go through bits of it here. But he took the helm of Texas Monthly in 2000 and quickly turned a good publication into an award-winning must-read monthly that became a model for similar magazines around the country. His Texas Monthly Talks on PBS became the venue for important thinkers and doers, either from Texas or those who are visiting, where they sat through the always respectful but probing grilling that Evan has become famous for. Not content or satisfied with all he'd accomplished already, Evan took the brave step of creating a completely new news media outlet at a time when everyone was proclaiming the death of regional and local news coverage. The Texas Tribune has succeeded beyond anyone's imagination, and I think everyone here would agree it's the go-to source for smart Texans looking for informed debates and information about our state's most pressing public policy questions. And Evan has just completed what I believe is the second year of the extraordinarily successful Texas Tribune Festival, which is, uh, from an outsider, looks like it's modeled on the wildly successful Aspen Ideas Festival, but is for Texas and has become the place for informed policy discussion. It's truly uh, remarkable. Now, all of this is very impressive, but somehow, with all these amazing accomplishments, Evan finds time to teach at the LBJ School, and he, where he's a very, very uh, popular professor. Uh, he's the perfect person to share his thoughts on what we've been eagerly discussing and debating all day, the future of Texas, its relationship with the rest of the country, and the impact Tuesday's election will have on these important issues. Not only that, poor Evan has been up since 4 AM. He gave five lectures yesterday. We are incredibly lucky to have him because he there's probably no one anyone would rather hear from in the state of Texas about what's going to happen on Tuesday. So please join me in giving a warm next generation welcome to Evan Smith. Well, now I feel like I have to be here with an introduction like that. I was uh, I was grumbling on the way over here from the airport. Uh, uh, Frank, thank you very much. Frank is right. I did. I drove over here from the airport, having flown in from Chicago. Got up at four to get to the airport to get back uh, in order to do this. I was on the Northwestern University campus yesterday. Gave five lectures back to back to back to back to back. The last one was the most important one, but of course it was last, so I was terrible. And I warned the people in the audience, you're getting the dregs. I, I think actually you're, you're not going to get the dregs today. Although I'm afraid some people in the audience have actually heard a version of this. Megan Woodburn is excused for the next hour. I think she's heard a version of this talk probably in a d different iterations for about the last year. Um, uh, it is an honor to be here. I appreciate it. I looked at the list of people who are going to be here, and I got interested in what this group was assembled to do, and I thought, why wasn't I part of this? Um, I'm, I'm jealous uh, and resentful, but mostly, mostly, <laughs> but mostly admiring. Um, it's an august group, uh, and the members are terrific. Many uh, very close friends, Brian Sweeney, who I worked with for many years at Texas Monthly and is still a great friend and someone I have enormous regard and respect for, Dave Shaw my Lyceum brother, um, yes, we have the secret handshake, uh, and other Lyceum brothers, and of course, uh, Representative Greenberg. I can never actually bring myself to refer to her as Professor Greenberg because Representative Trump's professor. They may be the two least admired professions in America, but I think Representative may be slightly more admired than Professor. Um, and a great partner as well, and Dr. Gavin, thank you very much for having us, uh, having me, and, I, and, and by extension, the Tribune uh, here, I appreciate it. I'm gonna talk about the Tribune just for three or four minutes my first of several lies in the next talk, uh, uh, just as a uh, as backdrop uh, uh, for the for the comments, which will almost entirely be about 2012, really November 6th, and then 2013, really the session, and the 2014 campaign, which if you think has not begun in earnest already, of course you're wrong because we know that the 2014 elections have uh, have have been happening and people have been talking about them actually for, for months. So what, what Frank said is is materially true. The, uh, the Tribune was, um, uh, start, in fact, tomorrow is the third anniversary of the launch of the Tribune. I've been running around during pledge drive week saying to people, are you better off than you were three years ago? Um, which I kind of thought was catchy. Um, the Tribune launched on November 9, uh, 3rd of 2009. Uh, Brian remembers the sequence. I quit Texas Monthly in July, left actually in August. We opened the office September 1st of 2009 and launched it 
uh, uh, on November 3rd, uh, it might make you think that we built the Tribune in those two months between the office opening and the third. Really, it was about five weeks that we uh, used to build the site from start to finish. Um, there was no research. There were no focus groups. There was no feasibility testing. This was a shoot first and ask questions later operation, uh, largely driven by our instincts about what was needed and what we should be doing. We lived then and live now at the intersection of demand and brand, basically. Uh, and it was asserted. It was proof by assertion that this was something that ought to happen and that we ought to do. We're now uh, happily three years in in the proof by proof stage. But I think in, the, in those early days, it was largely asserted. And you know, l let me say, uh, take slight issue with my uh, very generous uh, host, Dr. Gavin. I actually thought Texas Monthly was a great magazine prior to my becoming editor in 2000. I'd worked there since 91. Uh, when I got the opportunity to take it over, I was only the third editor in the magazine's history and believed that the biggest problem was the legacy of what came before. And it had been such an extraordinary magazine in so many ways for so many years, never the same magazine really year over year. I had a vision for what the magazine might be slightly different from what had come before. And I would say the, the best objective self-assessment I can make of those years that I ran it uh, is that we did some things better probably than had been done before and some things worse, but that the net net of it was that we did well. One, uh, a couple of national magazine awards for general excellence, which was the magazine industry's equivalent then is and, 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 and then was and now is, the magazine industry equ equivalent of the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, and I think we, we asserted a commitment to serious journalism, maybe more broadly, uh, which the magazine, after all, got its place at the table back in the 70s by asserting a commitment to serious journalism here in, of all places, the rest of the country thought Texas. And you know, there was a while there in the 90s when serious journalism was on the wane. It was not as popular in, in magazines as it has become again. And we said back in 2000, and the magazine, I'm so proud to say, with Jake Silverstein and Brian Sweeney's leadership uh, of it, the magazine continues to do the very best of any magazine I can think of of its kind and right up there with The New Yorker and the other very best magazines in, in c being committed to serious journalism. And that was really the, the foundational piece of this because having been on that platform at Texas Monthly and seeing what you could do if you were serious about it and worked really hard and took people seriously and thought about what was right for Texas and what was good for Texas and how Texas could be its best self, which was, I think, in the magazine's DNA. Um, I also had the opportunity from that platform to look at the Capitol, both figuratively and literally, and see what was not happening. When I moved to Texas in 1991, there were still two daily newspapers in Houston and in Dallas and in San Antonio, and even as recently as 91 in El Paso. The Capitol Press Corps was then three times the size it is today. Uh, the, the, what happened to the media business over the last 20 years, 20 plus years, is, is no mystery, and I don't place the blame at the feet of those editors and publishers, because the, the economy has changed and the media economy in particular has transformed to the degree that it's just impossible for the big newspapers, but really all newspapers, to do the same things they did once upon a time. They could not cover everything. They could not have as many people on staff. The human and financial resources available in newspapers 20 years ago, 10 years ago, are not available today. And so what newspapers have had to do, good, well-meaning newspapers run by good, spirited, civic-minded people, is they've had to choose. We can do this and we can do this, but we can't do both. We can do this or this, but we can't do both. So they looked out at, I would, my assessment of this might differ from theirs, but my assessment is that they looked out at the world and said, we know what people want to read. College and high school sports, crime on your street, intensely local happenings in their communities. They want color weather maps and traffic. But ongoing coverage, not just during the 140 days every two years, not just at crisis time, but at all times, ongoing coverage of public and higher ed, immigration, health care, transportation, criminal justice, energy and the environment, health and human services. We really can't afford to devote the resources to those topics that we did once upon a time. The aggregate of that by the time we launched the Tribune in 2009 was that really the level of engagement on those issues in the state, by my assessment, by Ross Ramsey's assessment, and by the assessment of the people who all came to work for us, was that it wasn't what it ought to be that the state had gotten less smart about itself. People were less aware of what was going on in the Capitol. People were less aware of the stakes they had in the resolution of these fights. People were less aware of who represented them at the Capitol and what those people did, both during the session 
And in my mind, more importantly, not during the session. Sherry knows, because Sherry's a good girl, Sherry knows that the time you have to keep an eye on people in public office is not when the spotlight's on them, but when it's not. It is not during the 140 days every two years that you must, must, must keep an eye on them, although you must. But it's during the other days, the remainder of those days, that odd-numbered year, and every day during the even-numbered year, that's when the mythical representative or senator sneaks out of the back of the building with a refrigerator strapped to his hip. That's when the trouble happens. That is when, in the interim, so much discussion about these issues that feeds into the session happens. And in the old days, the newspapers were inclined to do and could do the kind of coverage during that interim that really gave people a better sense of what was going on in their state. But that had pretty much come to a slow to a crawl or come to a stop, let me say generously, by the time we did this in 2009. So the idea here was very simple. We're going to create a new news organization dedicated expressly to covering public policy, politics, and government because it's important to do so. Because educating Texans on what's really going on in their state, in their capital, on these issues is important. And even if the free market can't support a model like this, it's still important and it's important enough to try something new and that is a nonprofit model on the basis that public service journalism is a public good. There are certainly economists in this room or people who've studied economics who know that a public good is a defined term of economics. My paraphrase of the definition, two important aspects of it, is it's something that the free market will not provide an adequate supply of left to its own devices, and it has to be non-depletable. So if Brian enjoys some of it, there has to be an equal amount for me to enjoy as well. Clean air, clean water, national defense, public health are all public goods. We said and believed and say now and believe that public service journalism is a public good, every bit as much as those other things, to the degree that it educates and informs people in the state, it makes them more thoughtful and productive and engaged citizens. It gives them the tools to make better decisions at election time, but more importantly, at all times. It's a public good. So we went to the IRS, and we asked for a 501c3 designation, which we, to our amazement, received rather easily. And we went out to raise money from individuals, foundations, and corporations to support this thing. On the, on the grounds that it was a public good and that it was essentially something to which you could contribute and receive a charitable deduction because you were performing a public service in your generosity. So we started out with 17 full-time employees, 11 reporters. We're now up to 35 full-time employees, 17 reporters. We are about half of the Capitol Press Corps right now, which, after three years, which says, I must say, says less about us than about, quote, them. Because what's happened over these three years is that the doom and gloom that we saw in 08 and 09 has continued and snowballed, and the upshot is that, for instance, the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, the number five paper in the state, no slouch journalistically over time, no longer has a Capitol Bureau. They closed it. And every other paper has seen decline in the ranks of their reporters, really great reporters like from over the years, the, R the R.G. Radcliffe's and Clay Robinson's, and most recently the Jason Embrys of the world, who were the people in there swinging at the ball every day, are now out of, uh, uh, largely out of b the business or no longer employed doing this on a regular basis. And so, you know, unfortunately that's what's happened, and, and happily we think we're here to hopefully pick up the slack and to provide what we do to other people. That is the model. Nonprofit, nonpartisan, yes, that's possible. I know a lot of people thought when we said we were going to be nonpartisan that we were making that up. Couldn't possibly be. Journalism means liberal. No, we mean it. Nonpartisan. Don't endorse candidates. Don't take sides. Basically, stick to the facts. Now, what that means is people will still be mad at you, but just for different reasons. And in fact, liberals are mad at us all the time, and conservatives are mad at us all the time. We used to say that in the old days of Texas Monthly, that's when we knew we were doing something right. When the liberals thought we were too conservative and the conservatives thought we were too liberal, and that certainly happens here. So nonprofit and nonpartisan, we have a free syndication model. The donors who support us, individuals, foundations, and corporations, underwrite the journalism A and make it possible B for us to give it away to anybody who wants to run it. So all day, every day, our stuff runs in Midland, in Odessa, Harlingen, McAllen, Amarillo, Lubbock, Waco, Corpus Christi, Tyler, and in Fort Worth because two of the 17 are Jay Root and Amon Bathija, who had been at the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. They were essentially approved. And in Houston and San Antonio, and occasionally when they get over themselves, Dallas and Austin. 
<laughs> there was, I, I, I will tell you that I thought back at the beginning, Dallas and Austin will run our stuff literally when pigs fly. I will have to see wings and the snout soaring across the sky, literally pigs fly. But in fact, they have been good folks to work with, and they have run our stuff as well. And so it's a great thing. We hope to raise $9 million by the end of the third full year, which is 2012, to support this thing. In fact, we will have raised 15. So $6 million ahead of plan with a model that had been entirely untried and untested in the worst economy since the Depression, at a moment when Frank said that everybody believed the media was, was heading south. We are trying to convince them otherwise. And it has been a magnificent three years. I have aged rapidly. <laughs> I now discover in retrospect that I was a gentleman magazine editor. I didn't understand how much time I had to think and do things. And now I feel like, as I've said many times, Indiana Jones outrunning the boulder. I cannot look away for one second or I'm going to get run over. So let me get to it, um, because it is truly a privilege to cover this stuff. We think about politics the way ESPN thinks about sports. We cover the players and we cover the game. There's a cultural piece to this, and we just we love this stuff. This is, this is our stuff. And so um, when we talk about it, we talk about it with passion and enthusiasm and asserted expertise. I hope that expertise is also proven. but. Um, I say that because what I'm going to say, some of you in the room will simply say, not true, can't be. The other night I was speaking at the Four Seasons Residences in Austin to a group, and I started talking about the presidential race and what I thought from that vantage point was going to happen, and a man actually started screaming and got up and left. He put on his monocle and his top hat, and then he left the room. <laughs> it was very offensive to me how that went down. But, um, so if you feel the need to scream and leave, I, you, there's a predicate for that. It's actually fine. So I really would say that the most consequential political story of, of this year in Texas is Ted Cruz. And Ted Cruz, spoiler alert, he'll win on Tuesday. Um, uh, and that Ted, you know, Ted Cruz is going to be the ne next United States Senator from Texas. The people who don't like Ted Cruz and think that he's 2-2 will say, look what we've done. We've gone from Lloyd Benson to Kay Bailey Hutchson to Ted Cruz in two generations. This is an outrage. I actually think Ted Cruz is going to be a very, very a, a strong addition to the Senate um, and will be a great senator. Uh, even. You know, there are people in the state who say, well, he's so conservative. And, you know, my attitude about it is you don't know what he is. You don't know what he'll be. You know, you campaign one way, you govern another way, you know, ever thus, ever will be thus. And, you know, let, let, you know let's see what he does before we start making assumptions about whether he'll be great or terrible. But I, I, mean, I think he's going to be a very strong senator, very smart guy, Princeton, Harvard, clerk for Justice Rehnquist, youngest and first Hispanic solicitor general in the United States you know, gives a great speech. What he's not, I've said this to his face, so I don't mind saying it to all of you, he's not a transformational figure. The national media came down here after runoff day when he beat Governor Dewhurst, and they spent about five seconds, and they went, oh, okay, and they went back, and they wrote all these stories that made him out to sound like some combination of Henry Clay and Jesus. And the thing is, he's not. He gives a great speech. He has a strong ideological core. But his skills as a candidate and as a politician were the third reason of three that he beat Governor Dewhurst. The second reason of three is that Governor Dewhurst, despite having won election statewide four times, once as land commissioner and three times as lieutenant governor, is a shitty candidate and was a shitty candidate. I mean, it was, there's no other way to say it. There's no sugarcoating it. He got in those debates against Ted Cruz. He was unable to articulate a rationale either for his tenure as lieutenant governor going backward or his presumed tenure as United States senator going forward. It was not even a close, a close match. It wasn't a fair fight. And the biggest problem that I think Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst had in this campaign was that going in, he had enormous advantages. He had, again, run statewide four times, won four times, very high name ID. We didn't know as much about his personal wealth then as we do now, because in the course of a federal race, he had to be more transparent about his, uh, his net worth, which now is, I guess, about, or was before this race, something like a quarter of a billion dollars. He had plenty of money that he could put into any race that he wanted to win. He could effectively buy it. I know that sounds gauche, but he could effectively buy this race if he wanted to. He even looked senatorial. Look at Dewhurst. Does he not look senatorial? He's one powdered wig away from being a founding father. <laughs> look at that face. Look at that bearing, that mean, right? <laughs> but he had a big disadvantage that, was, that I think mitigated pretty sig significantly the advantages, and that is that he was viewed by many to be insufficiently conservative. Now, 
allow me to observe with, with a, a, a song in my heart that only in Texas in 2012 would David Dewhurst be judged a liberal. But he was. Uh, he was viewed by many people on the right to be insufficiently conservative, or I should maybe say more accurately, unreliably conservative, because he had done things that you could say are conservative. But they always wondered about him. Would he do their work for them? And you know, could he be trusted to manage different issues the way they thought they should be managed? So if you're a politician of some experience, and you know that you have one glaring weakness that mitigates your many strengths, don't you run toward it to try to mitigate it? He ran away from it. There were something like 40 Tea Party forums that he just didn't go to. Now, I've never run a campaign. I've never run for office. Maybe I'm wrong. But it seems to me that if you're Dewhurst going into this race, you think, this is the thing I'm going to have to confront. I'm going to spend all my time on a campaign trail persuading these Tea Party groups, these conservatives, that I am, in fact, conservative. I may not see the world they do exactly, I see the world exactly as they do, but I'm going to spend my time trying to persuade them that I'm really acceptable to them. But he didn't go to all their forums. And so by about the 20th one of these forums, the Cruz campaign took to dressing up one of their staff members as a duck and putting the duck outside the forum. Oh, the big joke, David Dewhurst is ducking the Tea Party. I mean, I mean, he basically handed Cruz and the other people up on that stage, wherever they happened to be that day or week, an opportunity to say, see, suspicions confirmed. And so by the time he came around to the idea that, well, maybe this is really a problem, I need to mitigate it, it was too late. Now, I would say that notwithstanding, had redistricting not gone off the rails and the primary been held in March or May, Dewhurst still would have won. But the main reason that Cruz beat him, not because Cruz was so awesome and not because Dewhurst was so not awesome, was because the narrative elsewhere in the country fed perfectly into the race at the moment the race occurred. May, not March. What happened between May and March? First of all, before Richard Murdoch stepped on his tie, uh, he beat Dick Luger in the Indiana primary for Senate. Republican primary. Uh, Richard Murdoch, state treasurer of Illinois, Tea Party stalwart beat establishment candidate uh, uh, Dick Luger. Then a few weeks later in Nebraska, Deb Fisher, state senator, Tea Party stalwart, Sarah Palin approved, beat two establishment Republicans in the primary. So the narrative nationally was that insurgent Tea Party candidates are defeating establishment Republican candidates. Insurgents are defeating establishments. So comes now the May primary, Cruz and Dewhurst, and Cruz is sort of the next pebble in the path. And so I would submit that the outward pressure on this race from that narrative really defined the outcome. And as much as we're all brilliant in hindsight, we all now know that the minute that Cruz got Dewhurst into a runoff, Dewhurst was dead. And so indeed, two months later, what happened? Cruz beat Dewhurst. So in so many ways, the, the, you know, this is a, I'm, I'm going to say this over and over today, but Texas is a two-party state despite what you've heard. The two parties are the Tea Party and what we used to call the moderate Republicans before that became a cuss word. The Democrats are the third party in a two-party state. The action is all in the two factions of the Republican Party being at war, and they are. And anybody who tells you they're not is lying. They are. At, there's this, and you can think of it. Maybe think of it this way: the Joe Strauss Republicans and the Michael Sullivan Republicans. You like that better? That's those are the factions. And they are at war, and they're, everything that happens is happening as an aspect of that conflict. So this is, in essence, an emblem of that conflict. It's a very visible one. It's a very large one. But in so many ways, that is why the Cruz victory is so defining of our politics right now. Because it talks, it, it talks directly to the rift. It talks directly to the tension. And I think it sets up perfectly what's likely to happen in the next session. So we have another race on the ballot besides the Senate race, and that's the presidential race. And I, I've been really amused, to put it mildly, at how the national press has talked to us about this race. I grabbed this this morning on the Southwest plane with Wi-Fi. This is a great country. As I was flying, <laughs> flying in on the plane, I was able to get on the Politico site knowing I needed to grab the latest thing for you, and so didn't drop it in here. So you look at the national polls, 
in the presidential race. These are just the three most recent ones. Crap, there may have been six more since I drove in from the airport, but these are the ones that were available this morning when I was on the plane. One where you have Romney two points up on Obama, one where you have Obama one point up on Romney, one where you have Obama one point up on Romney. Very close race, tight as a tick, Dan Rather might say, right? Except for one thing. These polls, as they say in Las Vegas, are for entertainment purposes only. This is not a national election. And the fact that you've been force-fed these polls for the last few weeks as if they matter is really criminal. It's not a national election. And anybody who's been talking about what's happening with the, po if the popular vote mattered, Al Gore would have been president. It doesn't matter. This is 50 state elections. It's not a national election. And in fact, it's not 50 state, did that not come? The map, this is the problem with Southwest Wi-Fi. I take back everything I said. <laughs> the map did not, so I, I'm, I'm outraged. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I do. I hate this country. Uh, I will, but I'm going to, fortunately, I have it committed to memory. Shaw, I will talk you through it. Um, the point is it's 50 state elections, but really it's nine state elections. Because as we know, you know, Obama's going to win California, New York, New Jersey. Romney's going to win Wyoming, Texas, Utah. We know that. Basically, we're talking about nine states. So the race is this close, if you believe the polls, which I understand this year is some big controversy. Oh, polls are so bad except when you like them, in which case they're great. That's, that's fundamentally the problem with this whole argument about polls, is you hate them until they say exactly what you want them to say, in which case they're fantastic. That's the problem. But really, it's, it's going to be decided in these nine states. And here's the deal. Uh, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> the president's got a pretty significant up in this race. I'm not saying that an asteroid is not going to fall on this country between now and Tuesday. Or that some, you know, Joe Biden's going to say, who knows what, right? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there's plenty of time. There's now till Tuesday. But if you look at the map, if you look at the polling averages, if you look at Governor Romney has not been ahead in Ohio. There have been one or two polls that have had him tied. One of the polls that had him tied two days ago actually has Obama up today by two. Governor Romney has not led in any polls in Ohio for weeks. Governor Romney has not led in any polls in Nevada for weeks. Governor Romney has not led in any polls in Wisconsin for weeks. This is a math problem. That's what this is for Governor Romney. Governor Romney is a good man. This is not about Governor Romney. This is about math. And the math is you got to get 270. How you can get 270? Presidents always had an easier path to 270 than Governor Romney. And the path has not narrowed for him. It's widened. Now, Politico has uh, 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 President Obama, actually, they're, pro they're projecting as of right now, 290. I think it's not going to be 290. I would say my kind of Karnak, you know, <laughs> Nostradamus, you know, um, I expect Governor Romney's going to win Florida, despite the fact that the Democrats are now saying that Florida is back in play, and there have actually been polls that have President Obama ahead in Florida. I expect Governor Romney wins Florida. I expect Governor Rom Romney wins Virginia, despite the fact that Virginia is now, the president's got a little bit of a lead in the most recent polls in Virginia. Uh, somebody had a poll out there, had, Governor, uh, had a President Obama four points up and at the magic number of 50 in Virginia. I expect Governor Romney wins North Carolina. I think that was a given from the very first day. It was an anomaly that the president won North Carolina last time, although he and Bill Clinton are campaigning there on Sunday as if they think they can still pull this off. And I expect Governor Romney wins Colorado. But as I stand here, I need to be persuaded that Governor Romney is not going to lose Ohio, Nevada, Wisconsin, Iowa, and New Hampshire. I I'm just looking at the numbers. It's, there's no bias in that. I'm looking at the numbers. So I'm thinking 281, 257 from this vantage point is what happens. I do think there's a good chance that Governor Romney wins the popular vote. And President Obama wins the electoral vote. And if you thought President Obama was a socialist Muslim Kenyan for the first four years and illegitimate to serve as president, wait till he loses the popular vote <laughs> and serves for another four. I'm actually quite concerned about what's going to happen over the next four years. Because the most likely outcome at this point is exactly what we've had for the last four years. A Republican House, a Democratic Senate with a margin of only a couple of votes, and there was a poll out today, an independent poll that had Joe Donnelly up on Richard Murdoch by 11 points in Indiana. 
I mean, the Democrats may actually have more than a couple seats than more a couple more seats. Pardon me than they thought they were going to. Even as recently as a week or two ago, I don't think this Bob Kerry, this late Bob Kerry surge, fueled by Chuck Hagel's endorsement, is going to really make a difference in Nebraska. I still think that's going to be a Republican seat. But you know, the outcome of the Montana race, the outcome of the North Dakota race, the outcome of the Wisconsin race, looks like Elizabeth Warren has this, but who knows? Maybe not. Democratic Senate probably, a couple seats. Democratic president. Now what? Same thing as the last four years. And yet. The challenges that they face going in now are pretty significant. Have to figure out how to work together. And all the photo ops of Chris Christie and Obama, or as the Philadelphia Daily News put it on the cover, thick and thin. <laughs> so that was actually a very funny. As they say in the tabloid business, that was some awesome wood that they had there on that cover, thick and thin. Um, all the photo ops of Christie and Obama uh, 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 loving on each other, notwithstanding, I think we have a real problem in this country in terms of how people can work together. So this is where the race is. This is a snapshot of the race now. Again, come Tuesday, we could be all surprised. Could be. But so far, at least, the trend lines have been fairly stable and fairly consistent. If that's a competitive election, it may be one of the only ones on the map in Texas on Tuesday, because as we know, we've got 150 House members who are always up every two years. We have all 31 senators up this time. Ordinarily, only a third of the Senate is up, but because it's a redistricting year, in the year following redistricting, you always end up with all 31 senators up. We have 36 congressional races up on the ballot, the 32 current members, and the four new races, and a handful of statewide races, a couple of court races, state board event races, and so on. More than 200 races on the ballot, only a dozen truly competitive by even the most generous estimation. Now, again, come on. You want to tell me the system is working? That come November, come the general election, we only have a dozen competitive races on the ballot out of more than 200? By what definition of democracy, by what definition of the system that is the system that we're living under, is that a good thing? Redistricting plus, I would submit to you, lack of engagement, people not paying attention, people not caring enough to pay attention, so that back home people most often get reelected just summarily. There's not even a reason for them to come back home and campaign. This is a map. We did these two maps I'm going to show you, one and two. These are maps of, first, all the House districts in Texas, and then second, all the Senate districts. All the red districts are districts in which the Democrats didn't even bother to run anyone. Didn't even bother. What do they say at the poker table? You cannot win if you do not play. Democrats have gone AWOL. I wrote this column in 04 for Texas Monthly that the Democrats had basically gone AWOL. If you are a serious party, you run candidates up and down the ballot. I don't care what it costs. I don't care who they are. Tom Craddock is speaker. You hate Tom Craddock. Run a guy dressed as a chicken to follow him around Midland just to distract him. You run people for every, you run people for every, oh, we couldn't, they say, oh, we couldn't. We don't have enough money. Our money needs to go to the place we can win. Really? How's that worked out for you so far? You're at 102.48 in the House. The only reason it's not a historic low, well, I guess it is, a, I, I, now it actually is a historic low. Come think of it, it is a historic low, low ebb. The number of Democratic members, 48 in the House. You're at 19.12 in the Senate. <laughs> Right now, the Democrats, and look, we're going to get into the next session. It's going to be probably 95-55, Republican to Democrat, thereabouts. And the Senate will be either 1912 or 2011. So here's what's going to happen in the next session. Democrats will not be able to pass a single piece of legislation by themselves or stop a single piece of legislation by themselves. The Republicans will pass whatever they want without Democratic help, without a single vote, and they can stop anything the Democrats want, want to do. The Democrats will be completely irrelevant to the legislative session. Completely, completely, completely irrelevant. Now, that's not me hating on the Democrats. That's just a fact. That's the numbers. And so I think the problem here is we just, you know, we turned November into March. The only action competitively at Texas right now is in the primary. And you get a primary if you don't meet the litmus test of the activists on the fringe. So right now in the Republican Party, if you get a tuna sandwich at the Capitol Grill instead of a turkey sandwich, Michael Sullivan finds you a primary opponent. And the same can be said on the Democratic side. That's it. This is a system you want to live under, okay. You got your wish. 
I just don't think this is good for Texas. I don't, and this is not about Republican or Democrats. It's not about specific members. I just don't think this is good for Texas. Red is all the places in which no Democrat even bothered to file. And on the Senate, same thing. You know, that's our politics right now. 12 races will be competitive. And that's a generous definition. That 12 is generous. That 12 includes the Ron Paul race, the race to succeed Ron Paul, District 14, which I frankly don't think is going to end up being a competitive race. The one competitive congressional race is Gallego and Canseco in San Antonio, and that truly is competitive. There are about nine races in the, in the House, and there's a Wendy Davis race in the Senate. That's it. Nothing else. Let's talk about the speaker, who I like. I will cop to this. I, I think the speaker is a good man. I think the speaker has a good heart. I think the speaker wants to do the right thing for Texas, but the speaker is under enormous pressure politically from both the left and the right. From the right, because like Dewhurst, he is perceived to be insufficiently conservative, although when I ask my conservative friends, tell me how Speaker Paxton would have run the House differently last time. Tell me how Speaker Hughes will run the House differently this time. Tell me one thing. Give me one example, one, of what would have been different. What bill would have passed? One. What bill would not have passed? One. They can't say. They just don't like him. Temperamentally, he's not one of them. They don't like him. So on the right, I can't figure it out. On the left, we have a piece in the Times today about Trey Martinez Fisher, who effectively is a minority of one. Because he presumes to speak for the Democrats by saying things like, we're not going to vote for Strauss. We, he treats his enemies better than his friends. We're going we're to sit on the sidelines and make him win the Speaker's office again, simply with Republican votes. And then you go see Garnet Coleman or some of the other Democrats. Is, is, is Trey? No, he's not, Trey's not speaking for us. Trey's speaking for Trey. But there's definitely a move on the left to try to pop Strauss. We demand concessions. Ordinarily, you demand concessions when you have strength. <laughs> what kind of concessions do you think you're going to get? No, they think they can get concessions. I mean, it's, it's really it's a, it's, it, 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 it's exactly what you saw last time. Last time, Strauss had 101. J.M. Lozano switched parties in the interim, so now they have 102 Republicans, 48 Democrats. Again, they're going to get to 55, I think. I was with Trey a couple weeks ago, and I said, okay, let's do the math. I said, let's sit here, let's wait, like, let's, let's game this out. You're going to get to 55, yes. Maybe even more than that. Okay, Trey, great. Take me from 48 to 55, go. 49, Joe Moody. Stop. I don't even buy that one. You, I don't think Moody's going to beat Margo. Your two Democratic representatives in El Paso just endorsed the Republican. <laughs> 49 is Moody? Really? That's the best you can do? Moody? Yes. He's convinced. Not Connie Scott and Abel Herrero. Not Yvonne gonzalez Ture and J.M. Lozano. No. Not Philip Cortez and John Garza. Not Marianne Perez and, and, and Richard Benet. No. Moody is his 49th. I hope for their sake, because they're nice people, they get to 55. I'll believe it when I see it. I just don't think that's the environment we're in right now. Democrats are going to be happy to be at 55. They will at least have the Republicans below a supermajority. But they're not going to be able to do anything or stop anything. And that's going to be the case going forward for a while. The best you can say about Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst is he was re-elected Lieutenant Governor during the Senate race. That's my positive spin. He was re-elected Lieutenant Governor. The problem for Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst is that his soft political underbelly was exposed during the Senate race. They said he was insufficiently conservative. Whether or not that was fair, it took, it cost him the Senate race, and now he has to wear that like a sandwich board going into the session. And it's a Senate that's going to be vastly different. Think about the change. We don't normally get a lot of change in a Senate. But here's what's happening between last session and this. Chris Harris replaced by Kelly Hancock. Mike Taylor, uh, 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 Mike Jackson replaced, pardon me, by uh, Larry Taylor. Florence Pirro replaced by Ken Paxton. Steve Ogden replaced by Dr. Sh uh, Charles Schwartner. Uh, Jeff Wentworth replaced by Donna Campbell, who for journalists is going to be Christmas every day. <laughs> not because she's a bad person, she's a really nice person. Not because she's not smart, she is smart, but she is the epitome of the change in our politics, the epitome of the change. And that's not even counting whether Mark Shelton comes in 
and beats Wendy Davis. So you're going to have those five leaving and those five coming in. And so what's happening is that the five who leave are being replaced by five who are not just more conservative, but are more conservative by a factor of 10. And so suddenly the Dan Patrick, Brian Birdwell wing of the party, which was kind of on the fringe, is now going to have in its group those five. And you're going to see some of the ones who have been pretty conservative, but not as much, probably in a bit of a Me Too caucus. Robert Nichols, Joan Huffman. And so now the John Corona, Bob Duncan, Kevin Eltyf, even Kel Seliger, frankly, wing of the party, is going to be the fringe. And this is the Senate that Lieutenant Governor, I'm not conservative enough to be elected to the Senate, Dewhurst, now has to preside over. Oh, it's going to be interesting. Because what does he do? Well, we already know what he does once. He, he lops off Senator Zaffarini's head. Because the conservatives called for her head on a spike. And he gave them her head on a spike. This is, of course, referring to the chairmanship of Senate Higher Ed, which she had chaired for the last little while. And he had a couple of different choices. So Florence Shapiro retired. He had to name a new head of public ed. You may recall, if you're paying attention at this level, that in the Senate, public and higher ed used to be one committee. Then they became two committees. Shapiro led public ed. Zaffarini, a Democrat, led higher ed. Very controversial, Senator Zaffarini. So the conservatives have been calling for her to be deposed as chair. Here are the choices that the lieutenant governor had. One, reappoint Senator Zaffarini. You want her as your enemy? That's your problem. That's what I would have thought. Reappoint Senator Zaffarini and appoint whomever, Dan Patrick, who ended up getting it, as the, he was vice chair of public ed before, as the, as the chair of, uh, of, of public ed. Two, recombine the committees, which he talked about doing. And then he says, Senator Zaffarini, I'm shrinking government. I made the decision to make them into one committee. You can be vice chair. Dan Patrick's going to chair. And then he says, well, I've at least, you know, that way she's not mad at me for deposing her. Three, as Bob Bullock did once and came to regret, but nonetheless, he says, you know what? All Republican chairs. That was apparently under discussion also. And that way, Senator Zaffarini goes, well, at least he didn't just pop me. He popped everybody. But instead, he did exactly what cut her the deepest. He made Dan Patrick chair of public ed, and then he offed her very publicly as the chair of higher ed and gave it to Kel Seliger, who went to Dartmouth, of all places. I mean, this is, this is really, you have to understand how this is being viewed. This is like, oh my, so now, again, kind of, uh, uh, to make a ridiculous point here, now every time uh, uh, Senator Zaffarini goes into a diner in South Texas and orders rye toast and gets wheat, she's going to explode and it will be Dewhurst's fault because now for the next six months she's going to basically be licking her wounds, I think. And, and, and she has some reason to feel uh, aggrieved. But of course it is his Senate and he gets to pick the chair. And he picked the chair. And uh, Senator Seliger is a distinguished public servant. He'll be fantastic in that job. But it's definitely, the, the, the Senate is going to be a telenovela this session. It is going to be something else. Ordinarily, the Senate was the saucer that cooled the, the cup that was the House. This is Cup City, the Senate. It's going to be vastly different. Amazingly, I have like 20 minutes, okay. Amazingly, I've gone all this way without uh, mentioning the governor. I love the governor. Um, I do. Governor had a bad five and a half months running for president. We had a fantastic five and a half months. <laughs> um, what I will say simply is he went away on August 13th to run for president, came back at the end of January. It was like that season of Dallas where Victoria Principal realized the entire thing was a dream. Uh, it's as if it never happened. He comes back and he restarts all the conversations that he had been having before he left. Uh, and he has never believed in the constitutional notion that the governor of Texas is weak. Rick Perry ain't weak. And Rick Perry ain't going to be weak this time. He's going to be dominant, as he always is, uh, 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 leading a session where I frankly think that both Strauss and Dewhurst are going to have interesting political challenges, so there'll be even more of an opportunity and more of a cause for the governor to exert his influence. Um, he's talking about running again in 2014. I'll say something about that in a little while. But I think he will be relevant and in the middle of everything during this session. The most important thing, though, about this session is, is there's enormous turnover. One half of the Texas House next session will be people who are in their first or second terms. 
one half. Sherry knows that it takes until the end of your second term to find the potty. <laughs> These folks are going to be running things. And the people who left are not just any members, but some of the most consequential members, committee chairmen, experts on issues. You have on education, just to give you an example, on education, you have a chair and vice chair of House Ed and a chair and vice chair of Senate Ed, three of the four gone, plus the commissioner of education. Huge issue. Years of leadership, years of experience. Whether or not we have a budget shortfall, we will have an experience shortfall in the next session. And that is going to be a defining aspect of the session, I would submit. And at the agencies, Robert Scott, Commissioner of Education, gone. Tom Sees, Commissioner of Health, gone. Billy Milwee, Head of Medicaid, gone. Sherry Townsend, Head of Juvenile Justice, gone. All within the last six months. The first two, education and health, together, just those two, represent 73% of the unrestricted portion of the state budget. Now, to replace Sees, Dr. Kyle Janik. Just keep telling yourself, Dr. Kyle Janik is now Commissioner of Health. Dr. Kyle Janik. Replacing Commissioner Scott is Michael Williams, who's a very nice man and a very smart man. I like Michael Williams enormously. But from what I can tell, Michael Williams' experience in education is that he attended school. <laughs> I mean, right? He didn't come out of education. He came out of the Railroad Commission. So he may be fantastic at that job. I don't know. But Janik came out of the health field. Michael Williams did not come out of education. So we'll see. Experience shortfall. Think about that. Big things to tick off in the next session. Beginning with the budget, the governor has put a flag down saying not only no new taxes, no increases of existing taxes, no fees, no accounting tricks, no use of the rainy day fund except for very, very rare one-time instances, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have a spending problem, a revenue problem. Pardon me. We have a spending problem. Okay, but the first thing they're going to have to do is take about $5 billion, $4.8 billion, out of the rainy day fund on day one in a supplemental appropriation to pay for the Medicaid costs they knew they were going to incur between the last session and now, but they didn't have the stomach to pay for then. So they could say, we balanced the budget without raising taxes, without taking money out of the rainy day fund. They lied. They did take money out of the rainy day fund. They just wrote themselves a hot check. Try going into the HEB and saying, give me milk, eggs, and bread today. I'll pay you in January. It doesn't work. But what's going to happen is they're going to have to write a $4.8 billion check to themselves to make a supplemental appropriation to pay for the cost that they knew when they wrote a 17-month budget would hit over a 24-month biennium. And Dr. Janik just told me the other morning at the Austin Club that he expects another $6 billion plus that the state will be in the hole on the Medicaid program going forward into the next biennium. He was talking about 11 billion, and all the media people in the audience, their heads exploded at once. 11, what's 11 billion? What does he mean? He meant the 4.8 plus the 6 point whatever is what he meant. So spending, budget, all that. I know Susan Combs says sales tax collections are up. The economy is coming back. Shale boom, shale boom, shale boom. Say it over and over. All good, but we don't know. And we still have that pesky structural deficit without Steve Ogden around to tell us we have to fix it. So we'll see. Second thing is six school finance lawsuits now working their way through the courts. My prediction is, I don't know this is true, but I suspect this is the case. We're not going to know the outcome of these cases until after the session. <clears throat> I don't know there's going to be a whole lot of action on public education, either on putting money back in or maybe even on vouchers, which are kind of the charm on the charm bracelet of this session. Dan Patrick for them, Governor Dewhurst for them, Governor Perry may make them an emergency item. I'm not sure they get through the House. Vouchers are one of those rare items around which organic bipartisanship develops. Rural Republicans and Democrats both don't like them for different reasons. I don't know vouchers get through the House. Maybe they do. But I think it's going to be a harder slog for them during the House. Uh, in the House than, than in the Senate. But I actually think that maybe everything on education is put on pause until we know what we're looking at on the back end of these lawsuits. And I would s suspect that there are members who voted to cut public education last time because it was good politics, but they didn't really want to do it, but they had no choice. And what they're doing right now is secretly hoping the court puts a gun to their heads and forces them to do what they know they should have done last time but did not have the stones to do politically. So they can go back home and say, had no choice. So I think this is a very much an issue in flux, and we're not going to know about it until the next session. I think the higher ed reform fight will continue, even if Senator Zaffarini will no longer be chair. 
I think, look, you got to give the governor credit. The governor made a uh, State of the State speech in 2011 in which he talked about $10,000 college degrees, including books, and the intelligentsia snickered. I am aware of at least five institutions that are now offering $10,000 college degrees. There's a lot of innovation going on in the whole question of price versus cost. I think this issue is not only not over, I think this issue is as alive as it has ever been. It's and just starting up. It's just starting up. I believe it. I really believe it. I think you're going to see an enormous amount. I think that the whole con the whole uh, uh, online piece, George, is going to be another thing. The the UT deal that they just signed with Harvard and Berkeley and MIT um, is another part of this same conversation. You know, I, I'm hearing amazing things about Abilene Christian University, what they're doing with electronic textbooks. Apple is running around the country bragging about Abilene Christian University as their role model, their case study higher ed institution, converting entirely away from paper textbooks to tablets and iPhones. There's a lot going on, and I think that the price versus cost question is going to be a big one. Water, we know we just came out of the worst one-year drought in the history of the state of Texas. We have a $53 billion unfunded state water plan. The problem is it may still be the wrong plan, even if we don't have the money. It's a plan that assumes, to quote the president, you did build that, right? You're going to build a bunch of reservoirs. You're going to build a bunch of, or to quote Governor Romney, you're going to build a bunch of reservoirs. You're going to acquire a bunch of land, a bunch of right away. You're going to build a bunch of reservoirs. You're going to pipe the water to where it needs to be. There are a lot of people in the water business who say, you know, we need more desal plants. That the solution is not engineering, it's technology. We have $53 billion plan, it may be the wrong plan, and by the way, we don't have the money. We did a day-long water program at Texas State on Monday at which Chairman Ritter, Chair of Natural Resources, arguably the member who knows the most about this issue, as anybody, talked about a tap fee. His whole plan is, look, we all have to put in. Government can't pay for this or pay for all of it. So we ought to ask people to pay a little bit in the form of a tap fee. Individuals pay three bucks, or households will pay three bucks a year. Companies will pay 30 bucks a year. Industry pay 125 bucks a year. Pretty soon you get $26 billion or half of the cost. Senator Averitt came up. Commissioner Staples came up. They all came up and they said, no tap fee, no. And by the way, the governor has already said, we're not going to do fees. Where's the money going to come from? And this is not a problem that we can wait to solve. We've been running a continually updated map showing the communities that are most at risk of running out of water, not in 20 years, but in 20 minutes. Can't wait. It's going to take, as, as Andy Sansom says, turning on the faucet and nothing comes out for people to appreciate the magnitude of the problem. I mentioned the rift between the Republicans and the Republicans, and I do think that that is likely to be, again, a defining feature of the session. But here's what's not being talked about, and this is my point of personal privilege to bring this up, because I think this is the most important thing that needs to be talked about, not just in the Capitol, but outside. These slides, next four slides, are courtesy of Steve Murdoch, the former state demographer, former U.S. Census Bureau director, now at the Hobby Center at Rice. Demographic inevitability. We are hurtling toward majority Hispanic status in this state. You know the population numbers. We added 5 million people to our population rolls in the first decade of the century. Now 25 million Texans, 18 million adults. Of the 5 million added in that first decade, 85% non-Anglo, 69% Hispanic. By now, 2012, it may be 26 and a half million Texans. But we're going, racing toward a very fast-growing and majority Hispanic population. If you want to see how the change has occurred specifically, this is, again, Steve's slides, county by county, first decade of the century, in 161 of the 254 counties, the Anglo population declined between 2000 and 2010. Can you guess what's coming next? In 228 of the 254 counties, the Hispanic population increased in the first 10 years. This is not change that's coming. This is change that is two years old. A lot of people still think that in terms of population change and demographics that the train is at the station and we're deciding whether to board it. The train left the station some time ago and we are booking as fast as we can behind it to try to hop on the last car. And every day we don't talk about this, the car gets farther and farther away from us. 
And we're not having this conversation. We're not talking about what the change of population means for public health or for workforce development, for infrastructure, since the areas of the state that are growing the fastest are the ones that have been serially underinvested in, bridges and roads and so on. And we're not talking about public ed or higher ed. And this illustrates the public and higher ed point better than any way I can. This is 2000. If you look back to 2000, Anglos versus Hispanics, the only population group, age group, in which Hispanics outnumbered Anglos in 2000 was five and under. And Hispanics did not represent a majority of that age group, 50%. In 2040, the only population group in which Anglos will still outnumber Hispanics in Texas is 65 and older. And in every other age group, Hispanics represent a real majority of the population. And as you get down for public ed and higher ed purposes to school age, it's 2x and 3x and 4x. Again, numbers, numbers. What are we doing? What are we doing? So I think this is, I, I mean, it, if I ruled the world, which thank God does not happen, this would be the very first thing we'd be talking about on the first day of the session, on the last day of the session, and every place in between, because it is the hub, and every other issue is the spokes. This change, we're not talking about it. I'm not big on predictions, but I'll make one. Greg Abbott's gonna be governor in January of 2015. I know the governor says he's running again, or he's talking about it. I think that the, the pressure from below the ambition of Republicans who have been watching the state governed by the same people for the last 11 years the cork is going to blow out of the bottle. I, I just don't think that we can sustain another election cycle with the same same. I think Abbott's going to end up one way or another being governor. I think Abbott is too nice a guy and too politically astute to run against the governor in the primary. But you remember when Kirk Watson wanted to be senator and Gonzalo Barrientos was an inconvenience, and so he said basically, screw it, I'm announcing, let's see what he does. I don't know that Abbott would do that, but I think Greg Abbott wants to be governor. He has $14 million cash on hand right now. And there are an awful lot of people who would like to see Greg Abbott be governor. Many of them have been people who've supported Rick Perry over time. I think Greg Abbott's going to be governor by January of 2015. I don't know the route. I don't know what happens. But I think it. So we called the Senate race for, day, for a Ted Cruz on runoff night. And literally within 60 seconds, literally within 60 seconds, Jerry Patterson texted me and said, I'm in regardless of whether he runs again for lieutenant governor. Patterson, Combs, and Staples, pictured here for no reason other than that I had his picture handy, all want to be lieutenant governor. Maybe Dan Patrick also. Now, Governor Dewhurst says he's running again. I'm just going to say, we'll see. We'll see whether he runs. We'll see whether he runs successfully. We'll see. There's a huge amount of ambition pent up, directed toward this race. Now, just imagine what might happen. Perry doesn't run, Dewhurst doesn't run. Let's just play pretend. Neither one runs. Abbott runs for governor. Combs, Patterson, and Staples all run for lieutenant governor. We will have more open races on the ballot in 2014 than at any time since 1990. Governor, lieutenant governor, ag commissioner, land commissioner, comptroller, and attorney general. All open races. At exactly the moment when the Democratic Party is at its historic low Yep. No Democrat elected in the state since 1994 statewide. Since 1994 statewide, no Democrat has been elected. I often say, and I'm only half joking, that Andy Brown, who some of you know is the Travis County Democratic Party chair, is the highest ranking elected Democrat in the state of Texas right now. And he kind of is, honestly. On the left is the Obama-McCain map of Texas in 2008. Obama won 28 out of 254 counties. On the right is the White-Perry race in 2010. Bill White won 28 out of 254 counties. Not the same 28, but very close. This is the Democratic base vote. You cannot, cannot, cannot change the map if you don't change the map. And the Democrats who say, we're just waiting for the Hispanics to take over, all will be well, are in for a rude awakening. George Bush routinely got more than 40% of the Hispanic vote when he was governor. Rick Perry has not done as well. But I will observe that many Hispanics in South Texas, not all of whom, but many of whom are Catholic, are temperamentally small c conservative. Pro-life, for instance. Many have family in the military, so they're not necessarily in line with the Democrats on foreign policy issues. 
And the Hispanic Republicans of Texas have made real inroads in getting people elected to the Texas House. You know, you've got Larry Gonzalez, you've got uh, John Garza, you've got Raul Torres, you've got Aaron Pena in this last session, you've got Dee Margo, who is actually also Hispanic, most people don't know that. You've got Jason Vialba in uh, Dallas, who's running a very successful race, who I expect is going to win, frankly, uh, a seat in the Texas House this next, uh, next week. Uh, you know, you've got real, you've got George P. Bush sort of cooling his heels on the side. And you've got Ted Cruz, who gave the lie to the idea that the Republicans had an Xavier Rodriguez or Victor Carrillo problem. You know, the old line was, if you're Hispanic and you run in a Democratic primary, you can't lose. If you're Hispanic and you run in a Republican primary, you can't win. Well, that's now been proven not to be true. And shame on the Democrats for questioning whether Cruz is, is, is really Hispanic. Argue the merits. That's absurd. So it's not going to be the Hispanics who save the Democrats. It may be this Hispanic who saves the Democrats. I swear, I swear, Megan Woodburn can attest, I had this slide in my deck a year ago. <laughs> I didn't just do it after the Democratic Convention. You know, the Castros, I've known the Castros since before they were in, uh, in, in the public spotlight, when they first got back to Texas from Harvard and they ran for uh, Julian for council and, and Joaquin for uh, uh, for the uh, seat in the legislature. And, you know, Joaquin's been in the legislature for 10 years. Julian was on the council for four years, ran for mayor, came very close to beating Phil Hardberger in the first round, lost, went back into law practice, ran for mayor, got, uh, got elected, has run again and has been reelected. Joaquin's about to, to waltz into Charlie Gonzalez's congressional seat. The personal story you know, it's fantastic. They're young, they're energetic. Julian has been judged not just by liberals, but by the business community in San Antonio to have been a successful mayor. He's actually about to pass, I think, this, this uh, quarter cent sales tax increase, or eighth of a cent sales tax increase in San Antonio to fund pre-K. Which, you know, as mayor, if you lead a, a referendum to get a tax increase, that's not light lifting. That's pretty significant. You know, I, I think the Castros are not yet ready. It's, still, it's sort of still larval stage, right? <laughs> Um, but imagine this, imagine this, 2018, Greg Abbott running for re-election for governor against Julian Castro, Ted Cruz running for re-election for U.S. Senate against Joaquin Castro. Imagine that. Journalists are not reporters, they're fight promoters. They want action. I am waiting for 2018 because it may actually be interesting finally. Okay, now I'm done. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you very much. So can I, can I still do, Frank, can I do one or two questions? Do I have time? Can I do a, a couple of questions? I, I'll take five time? minutes questions, five minutes, sure. Uh, I'm sure and you know, you ought to feel free to take, take abs absolutely take issue with stuff I've said. I don't care. I mean, that's, it's, all, it's all good. So, sir. Appreciate you being here. I've heard you talk before, and you didn't disappoint today either. Uh, three issues that come up about real governmental reform. Okay. The filibuster, gerrymandering, and electoral college. Mm -hmm. What is likely to change if any of those three, and what should change first? Let me start with the last one, the Electoral College. There's not going to be any change. There's just not. Any move to change the Electoral College now, if Obama wins the electoral vote and Romney wins the popular vote, and there's any attempt to change the electoral vote, it's going to seem like sour grapes. Where were you after Bush versus Gore is going to be the response. I think the chance of the Electoral College no longer being the, the way that we pick presidents is zero. Uh, the thing about gerrymandering or redistricting, as we say it, we refer to it in, in polite company, um, uh, is, is that when the Democrats are in charge, they do it, and when the Republicans are in charge, they do it. Unless there's, you know, uh, uh, everyone agrees to some kind of, you know, arms reduction or detente or whatever else. I mean, the problem is that when you're the guy in charge, and, and in a way, strangely, the filibuster is the same thing. You hate it when you're on the wrong end of it. You love it when you're on the right end of it. You don't think Bullock and Laney, or Bullock and Gib Lewis, or Bullock and Billy Clayton, or Bullock and whomever, over the years stuck it to the Republicans on, or hobby? I mean, the, the Democrats did exactly with redistricting what the Republicans are doing now. Why should we be surprised? You know, Jeff Wentworth and Jim Baker and Jerry Patterson, three Republicans I like and admire, people you know, all believe that redistricting should be taken out of the hands of politicians and put into some kind of commission like they have now, I guess, in California. 
technocrats, you know, people who are not. Kel Seliger, who was chair of the Senate Redistricting Committee last year, said to me, taking the politics out of redistricting is like taking the calories out of fried chicken. <laughs> and he's not wrong. The idea that somehow this is going to be devoid of politics is just unrealistic. Of course it's going to be political to some degree. I don't think the problem is the way we redistrict or, oh, you know, as Trey says, and now apparently Bill Zedler and, and David Simpson are getting on this train to, to pop Strauss about this. Oh, there was some, something happened that was untoward about the map or that the racist or whatever else. I just think the problem is that over time, the map is ossified so that you now have these races in which there's just no, com there's no chance of any competition. You know, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in debates. Uh, I remember a few years ago, McCall... Carter, Doggett, and Lamar Smith all couldn't find the time in their busy schedules to debate once their major party opponents for Congress. Once. I've never written a letter to the newspaper in my life because I'm a journalist. I have my own place I can write letters. It's called the thing I'm involved with, you know, whatever. But, um, but I wrote a letter to the statesman saying I thought that they should all be, all four should be turned out of office just for that reason. Because the public deserves to see Two people from the major parties. I mean, never, never mind whether Gary Johnson should have been in the debates, which is a whole other conversation to have. The public deserves to see the Democratic candidate and the Republican candidate stand side by side on a stage, talk about the issues that they would be responsible for, and ask for your vote. And, and I, so I think that the problem is the lack of competition is essentially anti-democratic, small d. It's bad for Texas. If the Republicans win the war of ideas, then they should be asked to fight to win, or the Democrats for that matter. And if redistricting essentially takes the war off the field, I just think that's bad. So, but I think the likelihood of anything happening on that is zero. I think on the filibuster, there may be a greater than 0% chance that something happens, because right now, really, we don't live in a majority decides things system, and we, we live in a, in a 60 votes to sides. You know, there's some talk about taking the two-thirds in the Senate down. I think Dan Patrick wants it to be 19 or 20. 50 plus, it ought to be 50 plus one. I think across the board. Because what ends up happening is the, the minority party holds the majority party hostage. And that's the case when the Democrats do it and when the Republicans do it. I think it's equally bad. I think the filibuster may be a 5% chance of something happening, redistricting uh, uh, and the Electoral College, uh, zero. Sir. Uh, Mr. Smith, I say this with all due respect, but um, I'm curious, you talk about- Or well, say it with all dis- I mean, I would like them to <laughs> bring the disrespect. I have no problem with that, well, that's yeah, fine. Not that I'm skeptical of, you know, the tribute's benevolence, but if, if it is becoming rapidly, you know, the one uh, main source of coverage with the capital, yeah. I mean, how, I mean, you said that's due more to the decline of your competitors than it is to- well, well, you know, if they, if they were doing if they were doing what they had been doing historically, we would be not a blip, but we would be maybe a third of what was. I and mean, we're obviously staffing up pretty heavily, and that gives us a leg up. Uh, but, but I get your point. Yeah, I'm just yeah. inclined to pull out voices, especially on issues like this. Me how too. You, Me too. How can we? Is this is this a problem with the model? I mean, is, are people transitioning to to this public-private partnership that you've been working? With? Well, so that's an interesting question. So this is what happened. So so the Star Telegram, uh, we hired Amon Bathija away from the Star Telegram, who by the way was laid off. I mean, it's not like we went in there and you know like a raid on Entebbe, you know, that we snatched him away from them in the middle of the night. You know, they said we're laying you off because we have to lay people off, and so we said, just walk over here. And so then some schmuck on the internet writes, the, the Tribune is killing for-profit journalism. Because the Tribune exists and they give these papers an out because they can run the Tribune stories for free. The Tribune is responsible for killing for-profit journalism in Texas. How preposterous. They're perfectly capable of killing themselves. They don't need my help. Look. We're reacting to circumstances on the ground. Would that they were not the circumstances on the ground. I frankly would love it if the response to the Tribune was that the Dallas News and the American Statesman and the Texas Observer and Harvey Kronberg and Texas Monthly and everybody else were going to beef up our coverage. Now, uh, uh, Sister uh, Greeter over there, who is joining the Texas Monthly staff as a, as a regular writer about politics, is going to kick our ass regularly. She's going to do a fantastic job. That is a huge pickup for Texas Monthly. And we welcome her addition into this conversation. 
She was a great reporter at The Economist. She'll be a great reporter for Text Monthly. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. I actually think competition is good. Uh, the Dallas Morning News was hating on us when we were getting ready to launch. Oh, this is terrible. Shouldn't do, not, it's not going to work, and we're not going to work with you. And I had breakfast with Wayne Slater, as Ken Herman refers to him, TV's Wayne Slater. So I had, I had breakfast with TV's Wayne Slater about a month before we launched. And, and Wayne said, I want you to know, unlike the people at the news, I'm actually glad you're doing this. OK, how come? He said, because I'm old enough to remember when the Dallas Times Herald was in existence. And when the Dallas Times Herald was in existence and we were out there doing our stuff, he said, I'd get a phone call from the editor of the paper or my editor at the paper once or twice a week at 6 in the morning. Wake my ass up out of bed. Why didn't you have that story that's in the Times Herald? He said, I haven't had a call like that in 15 years. His attitude was that the Tribune doing what it does, if we lived up to what we said we were going to do, was going to create competition that in turn would make the other media organizations better. Great. Please. You know, we said very clearly at the beginning, if the result of our work is that we cause people to be better informed, great. If the result of our work is that we inspire the other media in Texas to do a better job at keeping people informed, and they're the ones who keep people better informed rather than we're the ones, great. I don't care who does it. I care that it's done. So I don't think we're the problem. I think that we're trying to be a solution. I don't think that we can be the solution. There was a lot of anxiety about whether we were doing a clear channel play here where we were going to become the capital bureau for everybody and pipe local content across the state from the home office. That was never the intent. But I think, you know, I, I can't speak for what they're doing. I can only speak for what we're doing. My job is to pay for journalism. That's what I do. I used to be a journalist. Now I pay for journalism. Maybe take one, one or two more. Kelly and then in the back. Um, you participated in a conference with Americans elect. And yeah. The Boy, that's hilarious. What were we smoking at that thing? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, you remember, I was a skeptic when, we, when they were there. Yeah. We're talking about independent candidates and both at the national level and the state level. And do you think that um, an independent candidate at the state level would add to the competition? Well, maybe rather than have a partisan primary, maybe more, make it more like a special election where everybody runs regardless of party and the top, the top two finish. You know, I, I, I got to interview Gary Johnson for television, uh, uh, whatever, a couple weeks ago. I wanted them to do the, t the time of the taping to be 420, but I couldn't get them to do it. I thought, I thought, I thought that would have been hilarious. Um, I found him to be really fantastic. I loved him. I thought he was great. I mean, he's crazy as a jaybird on some things, but that's okay. That's politics. You know, that's fine. Um, what I really liked about him was that it was another voice. You know, he's a peacenik. He's not part of the corporate politics. You know, he's got all these things that are part of his brand as libertarian. Um, Pat, some of you know, Pat, I like Pat Dixon very much. Some of you know Pat Dixon. Pat Dixon is the chair of the, of the Libertarian Party in Travis County. I did not know until the other night when he told me that he's running against Karen Huber and Gerald Doherty for Travis County Commissioner. He said, I'm mad. They're not covering the fact that I'm running. And I was thinking to myself, pretend you know that he's running. Pretend you know that <laughs> he's running. And, he, and he's mad because they, they haven't, the statesman hasn't even talked about him. He hasn't been in any debates. And I felt like an idiot because I had no idea that he was running either. You know what? <laughs> More. It's the same way with the press, by the way. I want more. I want more. I want choices. I want a marketplace. We, talk, we brag about how we have this great economy predicated on the marketplace and choice, except we limit choice. And by the way, it's the parties, Democrats and Republicans, who are the principal architects of that limitation because they don't want, a, you know, they saw what happened when Ross Perot got in. Been there. Don't need that again. And so they're going to, it's in their interest not to, uh, not to, 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 to allow the system to expand to include additional parties. And I think in Texas, there's even less of an incentive to do it because the Republicans are so dominant that I just don't think there's an opportunity. Can I take the last one back sure. there? Yes, sir. Okay, so, so you make a good case at the national level. We're going to continue to see a divided government, uh, narrowly split country. Yeah. And it's resting for gridlock and it's not working. Yep. We make a good case at the Texas level, we've essentially got one party rule, right. and it's not working. Right. So does democracy not work? What does work? 
Well, I don't think the, I don't think that the reason that it doesn't work at the at the national level is because we have two parties with an equal share of control. I think that the problem is that we have a mindset in Washington that no is a solution. I don't think the problem at the national level is that the two parties are roughly even in control of the apparatus of government and therefore they're never going to get along. It's that the temperament of our politics, the toxicity of our politics to today, which by the way is not an Obama issue or even a Bush issue, I mean, it goes back to Clinton or even before that. It's a long, long standing problem. Nobody wants to, to reach beyond their comfort zone to find common ground because there's a larger good. I think, I think there's a difference. I think the problem at the state level right now is that there's not really any competition or any conversation about priorities going on at all. There's not any choice. I think there's too much choice in some ways at the national level because the parties have hardened into these poses so hostile to one another that there's not any opportunity to find. I mean, look at how, how the center has just come apart and blown away. I can't believe I'm nostalgic for the gang of whatever it was, six or 14. I mean, I'm nostalgic for the people who were not beholden to the slavishly to their parties, but who were willing to say, look, I'm not going to get 100% of everything, but I'm going to get a lot of the things I agree with, and I'm going to figure out where I can find. This is a good place to end, because it actually ties back to the Tribune. We live in a country now where people don't talk to people they disagree with. That's outrageous. That's where the hard work of democracy is done is when you, 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 you force yourself to talk to people you disagree with. And you say, well, we're not going to agree on everything or even most things, but we're going to figure out the things that we can agree on, and we're going to look beyond our parochial interest to the larger public interest. All of this today that we've been talking about, whether it's the press or politics, it's ultimately about the public interest, which I would submit to you is not being served well by either media or politics today. It's too bad. We can change it, but we have to be aware that there's a problem, and then we have to be willing to work to fix it. Well, so, this is the perfect that's it. Next gen, because Good. this is what we're trying to do: Good. bring people together who don't agree and Good. try to come up with consensus solutions. So, Thank you all for listening. I, I appreciate it. Say, yeah, yeah. If this is what you're like after giving six speeches, ah. in 24 hours, getting up at 4 a.m. Uh, yeah, yeah. three days before a national election. I'd hate to see what you're like when you have a full night's sleep. Well, all right. I would spectacular. Thank you.